each other across the fires, their voices harsh and alien in Donnie's ears. Viserys was seated just below her, splendid in a new black wool tunic with a scarlet. And cold, Robert grumbled, pulling his cloak more tightly around himself. The guard. It rained up well behind them, at the bottom of the ridge. Well, I did not bring you. Out here to talk of graves or bicker about your bastard. There was a rider in the night. From Lord Varys and King's Landing. Here. The king pulled a paper from his belt and handed it to Ned. Varys the eunuch was the king's master of whisperers. He served Robert now as he had once served Ares Targaryen. Ned unrolled the paper with trepidation, thinking of Lysa and her terrible accusation, but the message did not concern Lady Arryn. What is the source for this information? Do you remember Sir Jorah Mormont? With that I might forget him, Ned said bluntly. The Mormonts of Bear Island were an old house, proud and honorable, but their lands were cold and distant and poor. Sir Jorah had tried to swell the family coffers by selling some poachers to a Tyrashi slaver. As the Mormonts were bannermen to the Starks, his crime had dishonored the North. Ned had made the long journey west to Bear Island, only to find when he arrived that Jorah had taken ship beyond the reach of ice and the king's justice. Five years had passed since then. Sir Jorah is now in Pentos, anxious to earn a royal pardon that would allow him to return from exile, Robert explained. Lord Barrys makes good use of him. So the slaver has become a spy, Ned said with distaste. He handed the letter back. I would rather he become a corpse. Barrys tells me that spies are more useful than corpses, Robert said. Jorah aside, what? Do you make of his report? Denry's Targaryen has wed some Dothraki horse lord. What of it? Shall we send her a wedding gift? The king frowned. A knife, perhaps. A good sharp one, and a bold man to wield it. Ned did not feign surprise. Robert's hatred of the Targaryens was a madness in him. He remembered the angry words they had exchanged when Tywin Lannister had presented Robert with the corpses of Rhaegar's wife and children as a token of fealty. Ned had named that murder. Robert called it war. When he had protested that the young prince and princess were no more than babes, his new maid king had replied, I see no babes. Only Dragon's pawn. Not even John Aaron had been able to calm that storm. Eddard Stark had ridden out that very day in a cold rage to fight the last battles of the war alone in the south. It had taken another death to reconcile them. Lyanna's death and the grief they had shared over her passing. This time, Ned resolved to keep his temper. Your grace, the girl is scarcely more than a child. You are no T. when Lannister, to slaughter innocence. It was said that beggars. Little girl had cried as they dragged her from beneath her bed to face the swords. The boy had been no more than a babe in arms, yet Lord T. when soldiers had torn him from his mother's breast and dashed his head against a wall. And how long will this one remain an innocent? Robert's mouth grew hard. This child will soon enough spread her legs and start breeding more dragon spawn to plague me. Nonetheless, Ned said, the murder of children. It would be vile. Unspeakable. Unspeakable? The king roared. What Ares did to your brother Brandon was unspeakable. The way your lord father died, that was unspeakable. And Rhaegar. How many times do you think he raped your sister? How many hundreds of times? His voice. had grown so loud that his horse whinnied nervously beneath him. The king jerked the reins hard, quieting the animal, and pointed an angry finger at Ned. I will kill every Targaryen I can get my hands on, until they are as dead as their dragons, and then I will piss on their graves. There were eight in the party by then, not counting the wolf. Tyrion traveled with two of his own men, as befit a Lannister. Ben Jen Stark had only his bastard nephew and some fresh mounts for the Night's Watch, but at the edge of the wolf's wood they stayed a night. Behind the wooden walls of the forest Holfast, and they're joined up with another of the Black Brothers, one Yuren. Yuren was stooped and sinister, his features hidden behind a beard as black as his clothing, but he seemed as tough as an old root and as hard as 
stone. With him were a pair of ragged peasant boys from the fingers. Rapers, Yorin. Said with a cold look at his charges. Tyrion understood. Life on the wall was said to be hard, but no doubt it was preferable to castration. Five men, three boys, a dear wolf, twenty horses, and a cage of ravens given over to Ben Jens Stark by Mester Lewin. No doubt they made a curious fellowship for the King Road, or any road. Tyrion noticed Jon Snow watching Yoran and his sullen companions, with an odd cast to his face that looked uncomfortably like dismay. Yoran had a twisted shoulder and a sour smell, his hair and beard were matted and greasy and full of lice, his clothing old, patched, and seldom washed. His two young recruits smelled even worse, and seemed as stupid as they were cruel. No doubt the boy had made the mistake of thinking that the Night's Watch was made up of men like his uncle. If so, Yorin and his companions were a rude awakening. Tyrion felt sorry for the boy. He had chosen a hard life. Or perhaps he should say that a hard life had been chosen for him. He had rather less sympathy for the uncle. Ben Jen Stark seemed to share his brother's distaste for Lannisters, and he had not been pleased when Tyrion had told him of his intentions. I warned you, Lannister, you will find no aims at the wall, he had said, looking down on him. No doubt you will find some place to put me, Tyrion had replied. As you might have noticed, I'm small. One did not say no to the queen's brother, of course, so that had settled the matter, but Stark had not been happy. You will not like the ride, I promise you that, H.E.D. said. Curtly, and since the moment they set out, he had done all he could to live up to that. Promise. By the end of the first week, Tyrion's thighs were raw from hard riding, his legs were Cramping badly, and he was chilled to the bone. He did not complain. He was damned if he would give Ben Stark that satisfaction. He'll make the appointments, Rob said. Catelyn had not heard him enter, but there he stood in the doorway, looking at her. She had been shouting, she realized with a sudden flush of shame. What was happening to her? She was so tired, and her head hurt all the time. Mester Le Guin looked from Catelyn to her son. I have prepared a list of those we might. Wish to consider for the vacant offices, he said, offering Rob a paper plucked from his sleeve. Her son glanced at the names. He had come from outside, Catelyn saw. His cheeks were red from the cold, his hair shaggy and windblown. Good men, he said. Well talk. About them tomorrow. He handed back the list of names. Very good, my lord. The paper vanished into his sleeve. Leave us now, Rob said. Mester Lewin bowed and departed. Rob closed the door. Behind him and turned to her. He was wearing a sword, she saw. Mother, what are you? doing?